one point on which there is a strong connection between Buddhism and quantum physics is their criticism of own being, their criticism of absolute entities and absolute properties. Instead, they insist on the relativity of properties to ourselves, the relativity of properties to our instruments of measurement also. In Buddhism, it's very clear. You know, many texts of Buddhism, many texts from the Madhyamaka, from the Middle Way, from, from Zen Buddhism, all go in the same direction. Relativity of property, relativity of being. For instance, Dogen, the Japanese Zen thinker, he says that in his very metaphorical way. This vast sea is neither round nor square. It is only where my eye reaches that it appears round for the moment. Namely, it's, you know, we, you cannot say that the sea is round or the sea is square. It's only relative to my, my angle of sight that it appears round or it appears more or less square. Okay? So you have a first idea of this relativity in Buddhism. Then you have also Nagarjuna, the same remarkable Indian Buddhist thinker of the second century of our era. There is no object, he says, to be known unless it is being known. What does it mean? That means that there is no object if there is no subject. Okay? But knowledge doesn't exist without this, which is to be known. That means that the act of knowing by a subject doesn't exist if there is no object of knowledge. So neither subject nor object exist independently of each other. They exist relative to each other. Therefore, says Nagarjuna, knowledge and the object to be known do not exist by own being. They do not exist by own being, they only exist, once again, relative to each other. This is very clear and th this is very powerful, as you see. Then, a commentator, a Tibetan commentator of the 14th century of our era, uh, a commentator then of Nagarjuna said something very similar. This commentator is Tsongkhapa. When valid cognizers exist, he wrote, then there are objects which are objects of comprehension. Okay? When you have someone who knows, then there is an object known. Here again, there is co-relativity of the knower and the known, of the subject and the object. However, continues Tsongkhapa, the two, namely valid cognizers and objects of comprehension, are not established by way of their own being. So, okay? so neither object nor subject have an own being. They are not established from themselves, from the innermost of themselves. They are established by one another. Object establishes subject, subject establishes object. So, in the next slide, I come to the extremely insistent uh, reference to relativity in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. First, let's start about this strange feeling that everyone has to be unable to understand quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is strange, quantum mechanics is full of paradoxes, and so on and so on. And a very celebrated physicist, Richard Feynman, said uh, in 1965 that nobody understands quantum mechanics. But, you know, if Richard Feynman says that nobody understands quantum mechanics, and yet, quant uh, and yet Richard Feynman is one of the best physicists ever, certainly one of the best American physicists, then you may think that there is something right in his remark. But Niels Bohr answered this remark in anticipation. 
in the 1920s, Nitzbor said, we have to learn what the word understanding really means. Our feeling that we don't understand quantum mechanics may come from the fact that we don't understand what is understanding. Maybe there is a new way to understand quantum mechanics. What is this new way? It's very simple. The new way to understand quantum mechanics is to relinquish the idea that quantum mechanics is a, a description, a hypothetical description of things as they are in themselves, namely of things in their own being. But in fact, quantum mechanics only predicts the outcome of our relation with those things that we explore. So quantum mechanics can be understood provided we discard the idea of our own being and we retain the idea of relations, which is exactly what Buddhism has claimed many centuries ago. For instance, Nitzbohr, we are both onlookers and actors in the great drama of existence. What does it mean? Usually we say that we are onlookers, namely observers, uh, as if we were completely external to the world. But in fact, we partake of the world. We are actors of its great drama. We cannot dissociate ourselves of the world. And therefore, what we explore is not the world, but our, once again our relation with the world. And many other authors say the same. I will skip some of them and come directly to more modern uh, authors, such as uh, Carlo Rovelli, who elaborate a conception of quantum physics that he called the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics. According to him, in quantum physics, the, ascrip the ascription of a property has, I quote him, no objective meaning or rather no meaning independent of the observer. Any ascription of property is relative to the observer or even relative to an act of observation. There is no on being, there is only relations with what we want to know. Uh, I can compare also this, uh, this move of quantum physics with uh, a move that was made long ago by classical mechanics and more precisely by Galileo's mechanics. You know, Galileo was a celebrated Italian physicist of the beginning of the 17th century, and um, he was struggling with a conception of movement, of motion, that was inherited from Aristotle. According to Aristotle, a body is moving or not moving in the absolute. Motion is a property an intrinsic property of bodies. But Galileo said, no, it's not true. Motion is not an inherent property of bodies. It is a relative property of bodies. Namely, when, for instance, when you are in a boat and the boat is moving, everything goes as if the boat was not moving. Namely, you can throw a ball and, and the ball would fall on the ground exactly as if the, the boat was not moving. You would not guess that you were moving from the simple observation of the phenomena in the boat. So according, according to um, Galileo, motion has no own being. It has only relative being. But in quantum mechanics, this property of being relative rather than absolute is generalized to all the properties and all the qualities, not only motion. And therefore, you could say that quantum mechanics is a perfect theory of the surface of phenomena, not of their depth, not of their absolute nature behind the veil of phenomena. Of course, when you say that, it sounds a little bit unsatisfactory. And many people, especially many scientists, many philosophers of the 20th century have reacted against that. And they have said, no, we cannot accept that. We cannot accept a theory that is purely superficial, that doesn't go to the depth of the nature 
of the intrinsic nature of things and only stays on the surface of relative phenomena. For instance, people have said, as quoted by Isabel Stangers, uh, that quantum mechanics betrays the idol of science, that quantum mechanics breaks the great dr dream of knowledge. It's a scandal. And indeed, indeed, René Tom, a great mathematic, mathematician, um, a great French mathematician, said that quantum mechanics is, I quote, the scandal of the 20th century. Precisely because of that. Because it doesn't try to get to the absolute nature of things and stays on the surface of relative phenomena. But maybe there is a way to accept that, rather than rejecting that. And this way can be to come back to what Buddhism uh, noticed about our relation with the world. According to Dogen, for instance, this whole universe has nothing hidden behind the, the present appearance. That means that you know, the very idea of breaking through the veil of phenomena, of relative phenomena, towards the absolute nature of things is doomed to failure because there is no such thing as something behind the relative veil of phenomena. Uh, 